Show me the suffering of the most miserable, so I will know my people's plight. Free me to pray for others, for you are present in every person. Help me take responsibility for my own life, so that I can be free at last. Grant me courage to serve others, for in service there is true life. Give me honesty and patience, so that I can work with other workers. Bring forth song and celebration, so that the Spirit will be alive among us. Let the Spirit flourish and grow, so that we will never tire of the struggle. Let us remember those who have died for justice, for they have given us life. Help us love even those who hate us, so we can change the world. Amen. This site is significant because this is where Cesar Chavez lived and labored the last two and a half decades of his life. Uh, this is also where people like Dolores Huerta and Larry, Larry Yetleyang and so many other uh, leaders and, and volunteers with the farm worker movement came to get their training and their skills uh, and, and really began to build a, a union that would not only um, impact the fields of California but, but really spark a movement that would impact America. Nuestra Señora Reina de la Paz, porque le dio paz. Now what we did was that we moved forward and we're working with marketing people. They say, that's too much. You, so it's, now it's the National Chavez Center. Except for us old timers, we, we still refer to it as La Paz. But yeah, you do get a sense of uh, peace. You know, this park um, is very, very significant in a number of ways. The most important way that it's significant is it's a place where Cesar Chavez uh, lived in the latter part of his life. Um, he spent time in these hills uh, that you'll see around this place, meditating, um, refocusing himself, re-energizing himself, refreshing himself. Um, and for that reason, you know, it's a place that really touches people. He's buried here. And on the 30th anniversary of his passing, you know, we're here to memorialize that, but also to, to really just come here as a touchstone of, of his life. And that's, in my view, what this place really represents. You know, in 1971, after the first grape strike was won, my dad needed a place that he could come and run the union from. He also needed a place that he could train people and inspire them and send them out to their communities. And then he also needed a refuge, a place that he could get away and could breathe and could think and get ready for the next battle. So all of that happened here in La Paz. His brother, Cesar's brother Richard, uh, passed away a few years ago, but he used to tell a story about being in, in the winter on a foggy day um, with, you know, in the orchard um, with Cesar on ladders that were facing each other because they were pruning apricot trees. And deciduous trees, apricot trees lose all their leaves. They lose all their leaves in the wintertime. And it's a, kind of a miserable job. It's cold, you're pruning trees, it's gloomy. Um, but what was worse was the farmer who had them do that work wasn't paying them on time, was delaying their wages. And Richard tells the story that Cesar said to him across, you know, looking through the tree to the other side while they were pruning, somebody's got to do something about this. That happened in San Jose, California. Cesar got this crazy idea in his head right here in southeast San Jose to start a union. When he said something needs to be done, he meant we got to organize, we got to start a union, we can't put up with this. One of the ways that, that growers have always, and not just growers, right, people that get in the way of progress, the way they try to diminish the contributions of, 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 of a per make, person making changes, is they accuse them of being communist, or not being American, or this and that, or stealing from workers, right? And so there used to be these big stories about how Cesar Chavez was pocketing all of this dues money and he lived in this big fancy house, right? Well, the fact is, is that this is Cesar Chavez's fancy house. Uh, this is where him and my mom, and by the time we moved here, it was me and uh, a younger brother and sister lived, right? You know, the, the farm workers movement uh, uh, really was a, was a multicultural movement. Uh, when Filipinos went out on strike in 1965, uh, they were the first ones to do so, and they knew that um, if we wanted to be successful, uh, we'd have to work together. And so that's when they reached out to Caesar, Dolores, and other leaders of the movement uh, to join forces. And so, um, you know, Larry Yetliang being the fearless leader of the, uh, of the Filipino uh, group, but also there was folks like uh, Philip Veracruz um, and Pete Velasco and Andy Muthan. Uh, a lot of those folks spent time here in La Paz. And then, of course, um, you had people like Cesar Chavez, name that we know, 
Dolores Huerta, but there's also people like Gilbert Padilla and Jessica Govea, other leaders who, who all worked here. And so um, uh, in terms of what it meant for, few, for people to work together, I think when we look at the work of the farm worker movement, there's two defining aspects of it. Uh, the first part is that unity part. Um, really, like I said, when folks came together, it was, it was a spark of that multicultural movement, um, but it also inspired people from all walks of life, regardless of your race, regardless of your socioeconomic status, uh, that you had a role to play within our movement. Uh, and that's why in the 1970s, nearly 17 million people boycotted grapes, because it was a really multi-ethnic, multi-racial uh, struggle. Um, and the second part I mentioned was that persistence part, that idea of the Cisa Puebla attitude. My Tata Caesar faced more defeats than he had victories, but it was how he responded to those defeats that defined his legacy. Uh, when he got knocked down, he'd get back up. When things weren't fair, he would work to make them fair. And when people told him, no, you can't, he would say, si se puede. The FBI had contacted, uh, had contacted the union on multiple occasions talking about plots that they had uncovered uh, where the growers had paid Hitman to come and get my dad. Wow. And so, uh, you know, um, he had a couple of dogs with him that were trained for security. And, he, and, you know, they sent him out and they could smell explosives and they could disarm people. And, you know, they were his protection. And so, of course, he named one boycott. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was huelga, strike, right? And, and so those dogs, those dogs protected him. In the years to come, generations of Americans will stand where we stand and see a piece of history, a tribute to a great man and a great movement. La Paz joins a long line of national monuments, stretching from the Statue of Liberty to the Grand Canyon. Monuments that tell the story of who we are as Americans. It's a story of natural wonders and modern marvels of fierce battles and quiet progress. But it's also a story of people, of determined, fearless, hopeful people who have always been willing to devote their lives to making this country a little more just and a little more free. One of those people lies here, beneath the rose garden at the foot of a hill he used to climb to watch the sunrise. And so today we celebrate Cesar Chavez. So, you know, this is uh, some of the folks, right? Uh, my dad, and then there was Larry Leong, who is the leader of the Filipino farm workers, right? Uh, Dolores Huerta, that you all know and heard of. There was Philip Veracruz, who was another Manong, uh, a Filipino elder that was a leader. My mother was put on there. Uh, Gilbert Padilla, uh, out of Los Baños, CSO. He went back to the CSO days, right? We were approached by the Secretary of Interior, Ken Salazar, he was, a sen he was a senator and then became a Secretary of Interior. And he approached me and he says, you know, Paul, uh, I want to make sure that, that the federal government recognizes your dad before I leave. And, and uh, there was a resource study that was, uh, that was passed by Congress and uh, George W. Bush signed it where it directed the national parks to study it and come up with some recommendations. And they, usually they make recommendations, you give it to Congress and then people work together in a bipartisan fashion. Well, he calls and he says, that's not gonna happen. And I said, okay. And he says, but I've, sp I've spoken to the president and he's prepared to use his authority under the Antiquities Act to name it a national monument. He says, the only caveat is he can only do that with federally owned property. And then the question came, would you be willing to donate some land to the government? And I'm like, ay, oh, Dios, man. I remember my daughter, she was like eight years old. I told Mija, they wanted, Dad, you better not give the land to the man. <laughs> Me dijo así, right? Right? That's my daughter, right? But anyways, but we sat down and, we, and the more we thought about it, we thought that it made sense um, because this way ensured that my dad's story and the farm worker's story isn't just part of Latino history or labor history, it's part of America's history, right? Because the, the, the national parks are, their, are the storytellers for the country. And then the other thing too about, um, about it is that there's a sense of permanence, right? You, you give it to them, then they have the responsibility 
beyond all of our lifetimes to ensure that the place is there and it's being maintained and the story is being told. So, so what we did was, uh, being the, the good negotiators we were, we said, okay, we're only going to give you like a little bit less than three acres of almost 200 acres, and we're going to negotiate. So we got some rights on how, to, how the story is told and how we help and manage it and stuff. So, so we gave them a little bit, but we also got a little bit too. Right? I want them to know that our journey is never hopeless. Our work is never done. I want them to learn about a small man guided by enormous faith in a righteous cause, a loving God, the dignity of every human being. I want them to remember that true courage is revealed when the night is darkest and the resistance is strongest and we somehow find it within ourselves to stand up for what we believe in. Caesar once wrote a prayer for the farm workers that ends with these words, let the spirit flourish and grow so that we will never tire of the struggle. Let us remember those who have died for justice, for they have given us life. Help us love even those who hate so we can change the world. Our world is a better place because Cesar Chavez decided to change it. Let us honor his memory, but most importantly, let's live up to his example. When we think about the story of the farm worker movement, it's, a, it's an important part of America's history. And so I encourage anybody who's American, anybody who's fascinated um, with American history, anybody who's trying to become an American citizen to visit. So this park is open to everybody, and that's who, that's who we want to come here. There are so many values worth hanging on to, you know, when you go on a trip like this, I think. I mean, this, this legacy of Cesar Chavez and what I've learned through these trips over the years, um, over and above my own upbringing, you know, have really helped shape my values. When we begin to see increases in visitorship here, and they begin to see that there's an interest of national parks goers um, and folks who are interested in history, learning about the Latino experience in this country, then they're more likely to tell the stories of other struggles, of other peoples uh, that may or may not be related to Caesar and the farm worker movement. And so that's why we invite everybody to come here because we really see ourselves as a site that, that not only tells our history, but that's gonna begin to open the door for other histories to be told.